alcohol. So as you okay, so as you already know, alcohol use disorder is a chronic recurrent disease. Sometimes frustrating when we see the same people over and over again in the emerge. Um, and a sudden reduction or when people stop, stop drinking altogether, whether they have a, a alcohol use disorder or they just drink chronically can lead to withdrawal syndrome. Uh, that's stuff that you know already. And uh, the management should involve both the withdrawal, the comorbidities and relapse prevention. So we'll try to focus on each of these aspects and what can be done. Okay, so the risk factors for complicated withdrawal, um, and those are important factors to questions in the, uh, in the emergency room. I understand that a lot of the questions that you may have or that we get from uh, emergency physicians is what to do with patients when we can let them go home, when we have to keep them in the hospital. So these are things to consider. If they have a past medical history of severe or complicated withdrawal, whenever we're talking about complicated withdrawal, uh, we imply mostly seizures and uh, DTs. Um, and also if they have recurrent withdrawal. So that's an interesting part. Uh, there's a thing called the kindling effect. Often people are kind of reassured if the person has had previous withdrawal and it went well. Um, and that's true to a certain extent. Um, I, for example, if you have a past medical history of complicated withdrawal, that's, that's a bad sign. But to the contrary, if you have no history of complications, but you have multiple uh, withdrawal, then the kindling effect is the idea that uh, it puts you at a higher risk of complications uh, when you keep on detoxing from benzos, either benzos or alcohol. So that's also something to keep in mind. It can look reassuring, uh, but sometimes it's not. Then also the pattern of alcohol and other substance use. So that's an important one. Um, often people won't think about letting you know what they use if you don't specifically ask for it, especially when it comes to medications. So that includes uh, prescribed medications. So that includes benzos specifically for uh, alcohol, but also to a lesser extent, uh, gab gabapentin, zopiclone, and other, other depressants, um, opioids as well. So depending on, uh, on what they used, it can add up and uh, put them at higher risk of complications. Also, when we're talking about the pattern of alcohol use, it's how much they use, how often they use, if they have to wake up at night, for example, uh, to drink. So those are indication of the severity of the problem and potentially uh, um, more inclined for complications. Uh, the severity of the initial symptoms, which you may witness in the emergency room, the rapid onset of those symptoms. So how long does it take after their last drink before they start experiencing withdrawal symptoms? Uh, I already talked about the, the, the use of other depressants mostly, but other substances as well, even if they're not depressants. And comorbidities. So as you already know, but just a few to keep in mind, uh, cirrhosis, for example, puts them at higher risk for complication, acute hepatitis, um, also epilepsy, once the, one that we forget sometimes, and, um, and the electrolytes imbalance and all of the other comorbidities. So that's something to keep in mind when you're trying to assess if the patient needs to stay in the hospital or whether they can go home. Um, Lab workup to consider. I suspect these are uh, things that you already do in the eMERGE. Just a few to keep in mind. Um, the electrolytes, the magnesium in, is an important one for uh, when, when we have a chronic alcohol use. We'll talk about it a bit more later. Um, all the liver function and, um, and uh, enzymes also. And uh, well, if you want to screen for uh, STDs, depending on if they use other substances can also be relevant if they're pregnant, et cetera. So that, I think this is one of the main questions that we get is deciding on orientation. Should we keep, does the patient needs to stay in the hospital or can they be managed as an outpatient? So we already talked about the risk factors for complicated withdrawal. So that's, that's a main one. Another, another important thing to consider is how much benzos they need while they are in the ED. And when you're thinking about discharging them, how much benzos did they use prior? So that gives you kind of, a, uh, of an idea of the, the, the situation. 
at the shim, if I'm not mistaken, we ask to be consulted after, uh, well, they, obviously we can be consulted for any other reason, but we ask to be more consistently consulted if the patient used 40 to 60 uh, milligrams of uh, Valium in the first 24 hours. It's not a strict rule, but it's just something to keep in mind. Um, previous treatment and withdrawal history, so how it went uh, previous times, including complications. The comorbidities that we talked about earlier, also just keep in mind the uh, Vernique syndrome that can also uh, play an important role and we'll touch on this a bit later. Now the social considerations, sometimes it's where the problem is and that can be tricky because are you gonna keep someone in the eMERGE only for social consideration if medically they're stable? So I'm not sure how familiar you are with the other uh, available resources, but there are other places where, where you can refer the patient if the problem is more social. Um, we often refer people to CRDM, so Dolor Cornier, which is the Centre de Réadaptation en Dépendance de Montréal. There are a few other options also, um, Urgence, Dépendance, Toxico Stop. I, I'm not familiar with all of them. We work most uh, with social workers and nurses that are better at uh, orienting the patients when it's uh, when it's mostly a social problem. Um, and just to keep in mind to uh, screen for um, suicidal thoughts also. Uh, so also something that can help you, I'm not sure if you're using uh, this regularly, it's something that can be helpful um, when you're trying to assess if the patient is uh, is stable enough to go home. It's called the PAL score. Um, and it's a scale, it's in uh, MedCalc, it's available in MedCalc. It's, uh, it's a tool that's been um, developed to assess if the patient is likely to have uh, withdrawal complications. To be fair, I think it was developed for hospitalized patients, uh, but it's also, we use it in the eMERGE as well. Also to be fair, it's not something we more or less assess the same criteria on a daily basis. We don't necessarily use this scale per se, but it's something that can be useful and potentially reassuring um, for the first, it's just a few things to keep in mind. So they ask you about other substance use, for example, uh, blackouts and uh, so yeah, so it gives you, it gives you an additional tool um, but I'd be lying if I, if I was telling you that we really strictly follow that. Um, I did an internship in BC. I think they were using it a bit more uh, there than we do at the SHIM, but it's so, something to keep in mind. Um, so if you, while the patient is in the eMERGE, um, I'm not sure if you're using the CIWA, the last version of the CIWA at, the, at, the, at RVH. Uh, it's something that we use consistently at the shim, and we have, I'll show you a bit later, we have prescription prepared for, for uh, eMERGE doctors with the vitamins and the, the, the whole protocol already prescribed. So the idea behind the, the CY, if you're less familiar, is to give symptoms triggered uh, benzos instead of a fixed regimen. And mostly, uh, well, there's obviously limitations that we'll touch on a bit later, but the, the, the goal of this is to, first of all, limit the benzo doses that are given and to give the right dose to the right patient at the right time. It's been shown to decrease complication and to decrease the time that the patient will spend in the hospital, including in the eMERGE. Um, and generally people find it uh, useful. Now, the downside, oh, this is the CWA, sorry. So this is, I took this from the uh, from the NEST protocol. So you all have uh, access to this. You might be already, already using it in the eMERGE actually. And it's based on 10 criteria. And uh, then it, it tells you if the, the withdrawal is considered mild, moderate, or severe. The limitations is that it takes it takes someone to assess the patient regularly. So I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a problem in your setting. In a rural setting, for example, where they have lower resources, it can be, uh, it can be a bit difficult. The other limitations that are more uh, pertinent for you and for us is that it doesn't, see why is good if, if it's only alcohol. Then if you have a mixed substance withdrawal, for example, 
problems that we that we have often is someone withdrawing both from uh, opioids and uh, and alcohol at the same time or benzos and alcohol that's also an issue then you're going to get um, mixed symptoms and the CY is not valid anymore comorbidities or even medication can also impair uh, your assessment of the CY the best example of that is beta blockers for example um, and if you also have past medical history of complicated withdrawal, the CY doesn't consider that. So you might want to give that person regular doses of benzos, but the CY won't assess that. It's also partly subjective, and that can lead. We've had problems. We still do. It happens a lot where the person, some patients are um, benzo seeking, or they're they find themselves more uncomfortable than maybe we think they are. And so they will end up, they, they, sometimes they know what, what are the answers to the question to get benzos. And depending on how, uh, how used the person is to, um, to administering the CIWA, uh, it can lead to intoxication and significant benzo doses. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Maybe I missed this part, but what? How do you define complicated withdrawal? What does that exactly mean? Yeah, we uh, complicated withdrawal is really seizures or delirium tremens. Okay, but there are other severe withdrawal would be based on the 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 severity of the all the withdrawal symptoms, but complications are really seizures and uh, DTs, and we'll talk about them a, a little bit later also. So I wasn't at the ship when that happened, but the CWA was implemented uh, in the uh, in RED, and the training was given to over 300 nurses. Now they have also the the eMERGE docs also have a, a standard prescription that they follow uh, that they can follow. They don't have to, and they have access to our team if needed. So they have access to. We always have a, a doctor on call, and there's a nurse also during uh, typical hours. The, by the way, the, um, the training is available all on, online for any, uh, any, health, uh, any health professional, and it's free. I'll get, I can give you the, the link eventually. So this, this, this is the prescription that, that we use. It's a one-pager, but I cut it in half so that hopefully you can see a little bit of it. So basically what it tells you is that, so if you evaluate the CWA, if it's over, it, recommends that it's over if it's uh, equal to eight or above, or if the heart rate is above or equal to 110, then you give a dose of benzos and then it suggests you the, the benzo doses, but you're, the, the physician is welcome to change that. We're actually uh, thinking of switching that dose because what we work with by default is Valium 20, Q one hour PRN, according to CIWA. Uh, we're thinking of changing it to 10 milligrams Q hour, Q hour PRN, um, just to prevent from a, a benzos intoxication. But that gives you an idea of what, uh, what we start with. And then, uh, yes, I, there's a question. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I have a question about the dosing because last year on Wednesday evening during the Cape Grand Rounds during COVID, uh, there was a, a doctor from Toronto who was prescribing uh, diazepam 20 milligrams IV Q1H uh, until the CWA was two or less, and then discharging the patient on no medications because he has enough benzo uh, in his adipose tissue for the next few days to protect yeah. him. I've never given 20 IV, and I noticed you're giving 20 PO. It I'm, seems like a high dose. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, so that's interesting uh, on uh, many aspects. So by default, our dose is 20 PO or 10 IV, although that doesn't necessarily make sense because it's the same uh, absorption, just quicker IV. So that doesn't necessarily uh, make sense. Is 20, 20 IV is, it depends on your patient, right? If you have a history of a patient, for example, needing 200 milligrams in uh, 24 hours, then it, it makes more sense. If, if you're starting with your average patient, I, I honestly, I often reduce the, the, the dosage to 10. I find that that's often a, a good dose, Q hour. Until CWA below two, that's quite low. 
um, we used a threshold of eight, um, but it depends on the patient for sure. But also the idea that the, they can be discharged with no, uh, no prescription, it's true because it, it's true to a certain extent. So it depends again on the patient, but the, the idea with Valium is that it's really uh, long acting, right? So it's, get, it's kind of, it's gonna taper itself down. And so there's been protocols where they were giving high loading doses, pretty much like uh, your doctor was doing, high loading doses and then nothing. And the patient would, would, would just taper on its own. Um, a lot of people find it quite uncomfortable. The other problem is if you discharge a patient who has received, for example, like 200 milligrams of Valium, he might not be able to walk even. So maybe it's not a great idea to discharge that patient uh, straight off. Also, if they're gonna start, you kind of have to assess if they're gonna, if they're really likely to start drinking the second they, they get out of the hospital while still being on a high dose of benzos, also not great. Um, but it's true that Valium in that respect is safer than Ativan, for example, because Ativan half-life is shorter, right? So uh, they are more likely to have um, to have side effects afterwards. Valium, the, the, the half-life is so long that it's, it's a protocol that's being used. It's not what we do, but it's, I know that it's being used and technically it should be safe-ish depending on the patient. Does that answer? More or less. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily what we recommend, but it, it can be done this way. Uh, and I've heard of, uh, of places where they do it this way. Uh, we, we try to do it differently, but for example, if a patient um, uh, absolutely wants to be discharged and is uh, assessed to be safe to be discharged, um, I would be much more comfortable having given them a Valium than Adamant in the image. Obviously, depending on the on the comor comorbidities. Um, on top of the in the standard protocol, on top of the benzos that we give the patient. So again, by default, it's it's a Valium, but the physician can change it to Adamant, for example. And we also recommend uh, patients to get uh, Tiamin, either PO or IV. And we also recommend by default giving them pyridoxine and folic acid and a multivitamin. And that's a uh, nicotine patch if needed. We'll talk more about the uh, why the vitamins in a minute. So that's the standard prescription. And often when we get consulted, the patient is already on that kind of that kind of prescription. And then we go from there and we adjust. So one of the complications that you're probably already quite familiar with is uh, vermique encephalopathy. It's a medical emergency. It's an acute deficiency in B1 vitamin. The reason why I'm mentioning it is that I've seen a few patients recently um, being on B12 uh, uh, vitamins instead of B1. Obviously, sometimes they also have a B12 deficiency, but I've seen it uh, 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 recently that the patient had uh, had Vernique uh, symptoms and they ended up on B12 uh, supplements. It's really B1. Um, Kane's criteria. So the idea behind that is that the, um, the triad that people are familiar with, so the altered mental status, uh, the abnormal uh, uh, oculomotor fun function and cerebellar dysfunction, the um, this classic triad is rare, uh, and most patients won't present with all uh, with all of these symptoms. So Kane's criteria, the idea was to add a fourth criteria to make it more sensitive, and uh, that's a food deficiency to be to not be eating enough. So we really ask patients for how they've been eating. Often when they drink a lot, they don't eat so much, and uh, that's going to change our our management. Um, it's been, uh, I have the numbers here. So apparently it's less than 17% of patients who actually have uh, a Wernicke syndrome that present with the classic triad. So that's the idea of the fourth symptoms uh, being added to make it more sensitive. What we recommend for prophylaxis, so if the patient has zero criteria, we still recommend just because of the chronic alcohol use, which makes them at higher risk, of B1 deficiency, 
we still recommend a, a B1 supplement for two weeks if you can. If you just give it in the eMERGE, that's fine. Uh, the dosage is BID because it's poorly absorbed when it's uh, taken PO. If they're at slightly higher risk, so that's one criteria, or a past medical history of uh, Wernicke syndrome without present symptoms, then we recommend starting with IV and uh, BID and then switching to PO eventually. If you are treating uh, uh, Wernicke syndrome where you have two criteria or more, then it's a higher dose of IV treatment. And then it's really recommended to keep the patient and to treat it as long as they, well, it, it wouldn't be you, but to hospitalize the patient and to treat it uh, as long as they improve or after they stabilize. The idea behind this is that the PO absorption of uh, B1 is quite low. That's why if it's given PO, uh, we recommend giving it twice a day. And that's, that's why whenever there's an increased risk, uh, we recommend really an IV treatment. Also important to keep in mind is to check, we talked about the magnesium a bit earlier. Magnesium is necessary for the intracellular uh, absorption of B1. So if you have, a, even if it's slightly low, um, we recommend also supplementing on, uh, on magnesium. And again, that's our standard prescription. So that's why the, the B1 vitamins are, is already uh, included by default and they can add folic acid and pyridoxine, which are to prevent other complications. Pyridoxine and folic acid are only to be added for a short period. We recommend two weeks when it's possible if you wanna do an outpatient script uh, or it can be given only in the eMERGE if, if the patient is just to be discharged. The magnesium is not there by default, but it's really something to keep in mind. And we also recommend a multivitamin. So we were talking about the complications, again, seizures and DTs mostly. Uh, so the, the typical prescription um, that we use, again, is gonna be Valium between 10 to 20. I'm trying to be as precise as possible, but obviously this is gonna change depending on the liver function of the patient, of their comor comorbidities, for example, uh, and uh, of the, the other medication that they're taking, their age, everything. But just to give you a ballpark, an idea of what we use, so Valium between 10 to 20, Q an hour to two hours. Sometimes we stretch it to two hours to prevent intoxications from uh, benzos. And according to Siwa, by default, this is what we use. So Siwa 8 or above and heart rate 110 or above. Then where it gets tricky, and that's if, if, you're, if the patient is at higher risk for complications, this is where we change it a little bit. So if you have a patient, and that's really useful for eMERGE doctors, because if you wait for the patient to be admitted, for example, it might be too late. So it's something that, that should be done quickly. So if you have a, a history of um, either DT or seizures in the past, you may want to consider adding loading doses. So for example, that can be Again, assuming that the patient has standard liver function and like normal liver function, uh, for example, what we recommend is something around uh, Valium 20 milligrams Q hour times three, not to be given if the patient is sleeping. Uh, so you, 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 we actually prescribe it like to hold the dosage if the patient is already sleeping or um, uh yeah, or nodding or whatever. Um, uh, so this is a loading dose. And the other option is to, for example, if the patient has had seizures in the past or epilepsy or a, a history of epilepsy, for example, there's two options. Either you go with a loading dose or you add some regular doses of benzos plus PRNs to be given according to CIWA. The, 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 the goal here is to really prevent those complications from happening again. Normally, we won't do both uh, loading dose and regular dosage. It's going to be one or the other, but for sure, there could be example where if you have a um, history of um, repeated seizures, for example, and, and high doses needed, then it would be reasonable to have a regular schedule on top of uh, loading doses, but usually it's one or the other. Um, 
And then on, on top of that, you add on your regular regimen, which is uh, to be given uh, according to SIWA, according to SIWA or according to withdrawal uh, symptoms, basically. Um, and then to talk a bit more about those complications. So for seizures, um, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Uh, so seizures is one of the complications of, uh, of, uh, of alcohol withdrawal. They would be frequent if we weren't treating alcohol withdrawal properly. They tend to be much less fre frequent nowadays because uh, people are put on benzos when they get to the eMERGE. The peak risk is around a day after the, the last drink, but it varies from one person to another. And there are increased risk if there's um, other substances involved. So that's really something to keep in mind. But if the patient is, uh, there's a lot of uh, benzo use. So not, not necessarily prescribed benzos, but there's a lot of uh, Xanax use on the street these days. And Xanax is, uh, has a very short life, so uh, short half-life. So that's really something to inquire. If the person is withdrawing both from alcohol and benzos, for example, they're at much higher risk of uh, complications. And so that's something to consider if they're uh, also withdrawing from either benzos, gabapentin, other drugs. Also to, to keep in mind the kindling effect that we uh, uh, discussed before. So if they've had repeated withdrawal um, in a short period of time. And the goal is to prevent, like we said earlier, so to, to give either a loading dose of, uh, of benzos or to have regular doses, uh, a regular doses regimen and uh, PRNs on top of that. And then to investigate if needed, like you would do for any uh, first seizure episode. Now, the second major complication is delirium tremens, so DT. Uh, the peak risk happens a bit later, so uh, more or less two days, a bit more after the last drink can depend on the person. This is something that we, can, uh, we get consulted for a lot. So that's an important point. Being withdrawing from alcohol and in a delirium doesn't equal to DT, and there is uh, a standard presentation of DT, not all delirium tremens present the same, but generally speaking, it's going to be uh, an increasing. So the, the the symptoms are the withdrawal symptoms are gonna uh, are gonna worsen uh, steadily, and then they will lead to DT. It's rare that it presents all of a sudden with a DT, except if the person was at home and then they present to you and they're already. Uh, abstinent for a few days and they're already in DT, but usually it's going to be a steady worsening of their withdrawal symptoms. Um, and also something that can be useful is uh, usually DT manifests with a lot of uh, autonomic symptoms. So they're going to be tachycardic. Obviously, if they're on beta blockers, then it can, uh, can slightly change that, but uh, they're going to have tremors. They're going to be sweating. They have often a low grade fever. They'll present with hallucinations, agitation. So it's uh, it's uh, it's not hypoactive to, to say the least. Um, and just a few uh, of the differential diagnosis, just a few things to keep in mind. Um, obviously the whole differential diagnosis for delirium still applies here. Uh, but just to keep in mind that benzos intoxication can uh, induce delirium, and that happens also uh, with older patients. So sometimes we're treating the withdrawal and we induce the delirium. That's not a delirium tremens. Um, Vernicae encephalopathy can also uh, can also be hard to differentiate sometimes. And then all the other all the uh, all the other delirium uh, differential di diagnosis. Um, so the goal again is to prevent. So like like we said before, it's to give either a loading dose or regular doses of benzos, and to then to give them also uh, based on withdrawal symptoms. The treatment of DT is benzo is to give more benzodiazepine. So there's there's been a a, a few other drugs also tried to. Um, uh, to help with DT, there's very little evidence supporting any role for any of the uh, any of the other drugs, including antipsychotic medication, clonidine, beta blockers. All of them uh, are not the treatment for DT. It's really benzos. Although 
there's a point if the person has received a high dose of benzos, for example, 150 milligrams of uh, Valium within 24 hours, and they have acute agitation still despite the benzos with few other withdrawal symptoms, this is the point where we're going to add uh, a low dose of uh, antipsychotic medications just to help manage the patient. Um, typically, we use a low dose of uh, Haldol. But the, it's important to keep on giving the benzos, though, depending on the on the symptoms. And that's also a point where you might there's a point where you might think of transferring the patient to the ICU. For example, uh, on our floor, we don't use Presidex and uh, Propofol and any of that. So that those would be patients that would be managed in the in the ICU at that point. But we do uh, treat a lot of uh, a lot of DTs. Uh, when they're managed with uh, with benzos only or antipsychotic medication. So we talked about those were all applicable when we treat uh, the patient in a hospital setting, so in the emergency or on the floor. Then one of the questions we get asked a lot is what to do when the patient is uh, is going home. Uh, if you've assessed that the that the patient doesn't need to stay in the hospital, there's no other medical, uh, medical reason to keep the patient, then what to do with that patient? And that, uh, that brings me back to your question uh, previously, where the, the patient was given high doses of Valium and then nothing and just discharge home. So here's what, uh, what we recommend. Can I just interrupt for a moment because there's a, um, a question in the chat yeah. um, that goes more to the previous slide and they're asking about the use of phenobarbital in the uh, yeah. protocol. So it's interesting, I, I actually, uh, I quickly read the summary of a study that was reviewing all the medication um, used for withdrawal and still Valium was uh, the one with the better outcomes. We don't, per, addition, we don't use, generally speaking, we don't use uh, phenobarbital at, in our floor or in the eMERGE. Um, the, only place where it would be used is if the patient ends up in the in the ICU. But I guess my answer to that would be that it would it would be uh, it's really not a first line uh, treatment. But I know it's it's trendy now and there's uh, uh, emerging evidence. But what I've read so far is that Valium is still um, still seems to be the 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 treatment of choice because it's safer and uh, uh, easier. Also, I guess there's also a, a cultural aspect to it, right? That depends on the hospital. I believe in Toronto, they use more phenobarbital than we use here. Um, but the guidelines here still recommend benzos as first line treatment. Great, thank you. Um, and it's funny, I've never, uh, since I'm at the shim, I, I've never, any. In Vancouver, either I've never worked with uh, phenobarbital. I think it's only really given in the, in the in the ICU, and rarely, to my knowledge, because we get consulted for uh, every uh, DT case, and I I never see patients on it. Um, so the withdrawal management in an, an outpatient setting. So that I'm not sure if you use gabapentin when you discharge patients. So there's there's two options for an outpatient uh, for an outpatient al alcohol withdrawal. You can either go with benzos or you can go with gabapentin. And if you go with benzos, the the um, by default we use Valium again because it's safer um, and longer acting and prevents the the prevent complications from uh, from uh, benzos because of that it's a safer profile but sometimes we use Ativan if we really need a, a very low dose for someone who has very few symptoms although in that case I would recommend using gabapentin so the idea is that gabapentin has not is not to be used when you're the patient is at a higher risk of complications so again seizures NDTs, although I would argue that that patient would not be discharged home. But if you have any, uh, if you think there's any risk of complications, it's safer to go to go with benzos. This is taken from the uh, INES uh, protocol. That's all available there. They have brand new protocol for um, alcohol withdrawal. Uh, and it's, they're pretty straightforward protocol. It's 
really close to what we use um, on a daily basis. It's hard to tell you exactly how much we give because it's going to be based on each patient and what they've needed in the eMERGE and what they've needed on previous uh, previous time. But usually, it, I usually would go with a Valium either five or 10 milligrams, sometimes around four times a day. And then I taper it down every two days. Uh, so for example, a standard prescription would be Valium 10, four times a day uh, for two days, and then three times a day for two days, twice a day for two days. And so within eight days, I've tapered my, uh, my Valium to zero. Uh, Lines recommends to, to have the treatment within 10 days. So that's pretty much what we're doing. Um, with gabapentin, it's a bit more tricky because the dose has to be adjusted depending on the tolerance of the patient. So here they give you an example. Uh, what's recommended is, is to start between 100 to 300 POTID, but then you might need to, to increase that. In our case, it's not so much a problem because we reassess, we, we call the patient and uh, we increase the dose if needed. But if, if it's a patient in the eMERGE that's going to be discharged home, it might be uh, slightly more difficult, although you can refer them to their family doctor for adjustment. But gabapentin is interesting because it's less, a bit less dangerous than benzo, so uh, they're not smarties either, but um, less intoxication. Uh, some people do sell it on the street, but less than benzos. So the risk for abuse is a bit less than with benzos. Um, and it can also be used as maintenance treatment for relapse prevention. So that's some, also something that's interesting, which is not the case for benzos. Um, uh, yeah. Just a couple of questions. So first of all, it's interesting, the, the dose, the Ines uh, suggestion for gabapentin is quite different from what it says on up to date, for example, and I think on up to date they say to do a four day taper of gabapentin 300 QID the first day, uh, TID the second day, BID the third day, once a day, the fourth day, and then stop. And that's uh, that's what I've actually prescribed before. I have no idea what happened to any of those patients because I don't follow them up. Um, and uh, and the other thing is, I uh, do you ever use gabapentin in patients who are admitted? Because often people come in with alcohol withdrawal, but that's not why they're there. So you can't actually just mm -hmm. discharge them because their withdrawal is is mild. You have to admit them for the other problem that they have. Yeah. Um, and do you, so do you sometimes prescribe gabapentin to those people who are not like their CY is less than eight? Yeah, we do. Um, well, we rarely, so if the, if the patient, for example, in our service, if the patient is admitted for uh, opioid, any other problem, often I would say that we're going to start with benzos just because they're in the hospital. So uh, they, we we can easily adapt the, the treatment and adjust. But if we see that they need very few doses, um, then we'll switch to gabapentin and we'll adjust. And sometimes we'll propose as a, as relapse prevention. We'll propose to to keep them on it if it was uh, if it if the patient liked it and it was useful. So sometimes it happens that we do use it in in an inpatient setting. Um, I, I've seen that in Vancouver, for example, they use it way more than we do. They are more concerned about benzos abuse. And I think they're they're absolutely right. I think they're correct. It's just, uh, it, it it's relatively new that a gabapentin is used here for alcohol withdrawal. So some doctors are less comfortable with it and still prefer to start with benzos, but often they realize the patient doesn't needs either really low doses or so then they will switch to gabapentin, but it would be really, um, uh, really okay to start with gabapentin altogether. If if it's an inpatient setting, it's even easier because you can adjust the the dosage. I I so there's been a lot of uh, discussions over how to prescribe gabapentin for withdrawal, and I, I I'm not sure if they changed their their prescription, but when I was in Vancouver, they were starting with higher doses and decreasing, not as quickly as uh, as up to date is saying. Uh, but they were starting with really high doses. So uh, between, 
close to the maximum doses, which is uh, 1800 milligrams a day. So divided in three doses. And what they were telling patients is to adjust uh, depending on their symptoms. So basically what you can tell your patient is that if they're taking too much, it's gonna make them feel a bit drunk. Uh, they're gonna be a toxic, uh, slower speech. They're uh, more prone to falling asleep. Here, what the, the, the guidelines are really saying to start it lower and to increase if needed. But if you start lower and it seems to be enough to manage the, so it's really on a symptom basis, right? So it's difficult to know in advance. And the important, that's the important part is to assure that the person can have, a, can have follow up. And that's the tricky part for emergency doctors because ideally the patient would follow up with their family doctor. If they have a family doctor, that's, that's what I would tell them to do. I would probably prescribe maybe 300 milligrams, uh, three times a day and tell them to adjust. If it, if it's a bit too much, they can, uh, they can decrease the dose slightly. And I would ask them to follow up with their family doctor as quickly as possible. But realistically, a lot of patients don't have a family doctor. So that's important in the discharge in instructions to tell them to come back if the withdrawal symptoms are off the chart and not managed. You can really tell them that they can. So gabapentin is tricky because you don't want to play with the, with the drug either. And it has to be tapered down, ideally, not to be stopped altogether because then it can induce, uh, it lowers the threshold for seizures, right? Um, also important to tell the patients is not to mix that, either benzos or gabapentin cannot be mixed with alcohol. So that's really something that I focus on when I give them the discharge instructions. Legally speaking, it's an important part also, not to be driving. Also, even if it's only gabapentin, when we start it, I tell them not to drive because they don't know how they will, um, they will respond to it. And I see your question, I'll be, I'll be with you in a second. And uh, to be careful also if they use other substances, for example, someone who's also an opioid, um, I'd be very uh, cautious with giving them benzos or gabapentin, even gabapentin can uh, uh, potentiate opioids. That's also a tricky one. That's those patients, maybe I would be more prone, not maybe, I would be more prone to keep them in the hospital actually for that, for withdrawal uh, if they're on opioids. And also an, um, uh, if you wanna be a bit safer in, in the way you prescribe is to make them go to the pharmacy really often. So either, especially in, we're in Montreal, so it's different if you're in a rural setting, but uh, generally speaking, the pharmacy is not too far. So we fax the prescription to their pharmacy and we ask the patients that the patient is only given the medication either on a daily basis or for two days and not to be uh, given the medication if they seem uh, intoxicated. So that's also that get something that can be useful. But the gabapentin prescription, I have to say, it's it's uh, much easier when you get to uh, when you get to follow the patient afterwards slightly trickier, but it's the same for benzos. You, you don't really know how much the, the person is going to need. So you can try a dose in the, uh, in the eMERGE based your, your, based your assessment, depending on how much they needed in the eMERGE and, uh, and go from there. And if you have previous histories of uh, treatment, that's really helpful. You can ask the patient, how was the last time? Like, was it too much? Was it too little? Were your symptoms um, manage properly or not, that can be useful also. I think there's a, another question. There's a hand raised and then there's yeah. another question in the chat. Hi, thank you so much for this great talk. Uh, my name is Gemma. I am a third year resident and I just had a quick question about safety with the discharge prescription. My biggest concern is that a lot of the patients that I've seen who struggle with alcohol use disorder, um, they often you know, they, they're experiencing homelessness. Um, ca capacity for many decisions is often something that's challenging. Um, and my biggest concern is that we'd give them this prescription and then they'd go home and drink or use yeah. and overdose and die. So would you consider that grounds for considering admission? Like it might be a bit of a silly question, but I guess I'm just worried about no. the safety of sending these people with such a potentially dangerous drug. No, no, it's a good question. Um, so that's going to play a role in our management. So depending, first of all, 
it depends also if the patient wants to stop drinking. For example, if the patient presents to the eMERGE for another problem and they intend to keep on drinking, obviously I'm not going to prescribe them benzos or gabapentin. If they're highly motivated and, uh, and they really want to stop, then sometimes we do keep patients if we, if we assess that it's really unsafe to let them uh, detox uh, at home, especially if they don't have a home. Um, so that's 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 that happens that the, the main reason for hospitalization is going to be social but there are other places where you can refer them so the crdm and other places like that Texco stuff there's a few i i have a list at the end of uh, of some resources that you can consider where it can be um a good in-between option if you're if you're uh if you're mostly worried about social uh, reasons, not so much medical. So that's, that's an option. And also uh, to have them uh, dispense at the, at the pharmacy every day is also a way to make it a bit safer, right? So uh, there's still a risk uh, for sure, but it, it's less than if they go home with a, a big uh, prescription of Valium and then you, you don't really know what's going on. And obviously I, I, uh, I make sure to put all that in writing that we had the conversation and I tell them not to drive and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, oh, you said there's a question. Yeah, there. there's a question in the chat, but I think maybe we'll ask it a little bit later because it's sort of um, on going on to a new topic. So um, I'll let you continue with. Uh, okay. So, so basically those prescriptions can be useful. It's quite the, the, the protocol from the uh, Linnaeus it's a protocol, it's never perfect, but um, it's close to what we do uh, on a daily basis. So that it, it is similar to, to our, our prescriptions. So that can be useful as a, uh, as a reference point um, if you forget about this. And uh, the goal is to limit the, the treatment. Uh, again, gabapentin can be used as relapse prevention as well, but not benzos. Um, so if you do prescribe uh, benzos, the goal is to limit the, the time frame within a few, uh, generally within, uh, within 10 days. There are exceptions, but generally it's less than 10 day prescription. Relapse prevention, that's a part where you I can actually do a lot as, uh, as eMERGE doctors. So the goal there is to help the patient if it's the patient goal, again, it's not to be uh, imposed on them, but if their goal is to uh, either be com completely abstinent or to reduce their drinking, we can help them with that. Uh, in the case of uh, reducing drinking, it's, it's naltrexone and it's the molecule we're gonna talk about uh, mostly. So if there's one thing to remember about relapse prevention, it's really the prescription of uh, naltrexone. I'll, I'll touch a word on the other options, but I think they're less relevant for uh, eMERGE doctors. So naltrexone is the first line treatment for relapse prevention. It's an opioid antagonist. So uh, uh, just to keep in mind that if the patient is already using opioid, it's not a good idea because you're going to precipitate withdrawal if you put them on, on naltrexone. There's been a, a few cases of uh, disastrous use of naltrexone on a patient that was on methadone forever and then they precipitate into withdrawal. Um, it's very easy to prescribe. We usually start it at half dose just to minimize the, the, the side effects. So that's 25 milligrams per day uh, for a few days, two to four days and then you increase to the regular dose, the patient doesn't need to be reassessed. The prescription already uh, plans that the, it's gonna be uh, increased to 50 milligrams a day. Generally, we recommend to prescribe it for at least three months to start, but it can be continued further um, if it's helping the patient. There are few contraindication uh, history of uh, allergic reaction, which is extremely rare opioid use. Um, and then the, the other important one, so opioid reuse is really important, and uh, liver failure. So liver failure or acute hepatitis, and there's even a, a threshold that's indicated in the guidelines, which is above 2.5, the upper normal limit of AST and or ALT. That would be a contraindication if you want to be by the book for naltrexone. Um, 
Most of the time we think that being on naltrexone is going to be much less dangerous than going back to drinking, but still uh, it would be safer to avoid it if you have one of these options. Cirrhosis is also a contraindication, but I would argue that uh, we generally, if, if it's a child A, uh, it's generally it's not a problem. It's more if it's a child B or C, and especially if it's decompensated cirrhosis, then it's really, um, then it, it, naltrexone should not be used. Generally, it's well tolerated. Uh, a few uh, patients uh, have uh, mild side effects in the first couple of days. That's why, why we start with half doses in the beginning. Um, but generally, most of the side effects go away after a little while. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, also to know, it's important to tell the patient that's according to guideline again, you don't necessarily need to do anything about that personally as a, as a emerged doctors, but it's important to tell the patient that they should have liver function testing and uh, um, enzymes, uh, liver enzymes tested a month more or less after they start the treatment. And then every six months, is, if the treatment is prolonged, um, you can refer them to their family doctors for that. We even have a one pager that we use that I could give you a copy uh, telling the family doctors that we started patients on naltrexone and that they should uh, check the guideline and do a, a follow-up liver panel in a month. Um, uh, and then the other important part is to tell people to keep on using naltrexone if they do go back to drinking. The idea behind that is that Naltrexone works two different ways. It helps people, it's been proven to help people maintain abstinence, but it's also been proven, and it's the only of the relapse uh, prevention drugs that has the, the that's also been proven to, re to reduce the binge drinking days. So if the person goes back to drinking, they should keep on taking the medication and hopefully it's gonna help them reduce the amount that they drink. Um, Sometimes people are scared because they remember of an uh, anti-abuse drug that we don't use anymore. Uh, and so they, they stop taking naltrexone if they go back to drinking. So it's important to tell them to keep on taking naltrexone if they do. There are other options that uh, were mostly uh, deemed to be either too dangerous or uh, less efficient. So we don't generally prescribe either topiramat, baclofen, uh, and sulfiram antabus, we don't use them. Uh, generally speaking, there, there would be a few exceptions, but I, we, we don't recommend them and they're not part of the guidelines anymore. There's a question in the chat. Yes. Um, Josh, did you wanna just ask it or? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, great points about naltrexone. Uh, I have like an academic uh, understanding of it, but never used it practically. Um, so I just had three questions. They kind of tie into each other. One is how much do you actually improve the percentage of patients uh, maintaining abstinence or achieving abstinence? That's number one. Two is how much do patients comply with the prescriptions? Let's mm -hmm. say at six weeks and six months. And then third, how much can patients expect to pay for this treatment? Is it affordable? Okay, so I'm gonna try to answer uh, all of your uh, questions to the best of my knowledge. It's... Uh... It's part of the uh, RAM Q. It's covered uh, naltrexone, so it's not too uh, not too expensive. Um, how much they reduce the binge drinking days, and how much they improve abstinence? I read the numbers recently. I think it's around ten percent, but I'll double check and I'll let you know. It's not, you know, it's, it's not it's not the greatest. But when we compare to other treatment that we prescribe on a daily basis, uh, it's still reasonable. And also considering that it has pretty much no side effects or very limited side effects, um, and it's a very safe medication. So I think it's really worth giving it a try. Um, so it's around 10%, but I'll, I'll get back to you. And it's the same more or less for all the relapse prevention, uh, all the three options that we recommend of the relapse prevention medication. Um, although naltrexone is the only one that has an impact on the binging days and binging is considered, I think four or five drinks a day or more. Um, so th that's based on the, the recommendation of daily alcohol use. Um, so naltrexone is the only one who has an effect on both abstinence and the binge drinking days. 
Now, those are the numbers in the, in the studies where we see on a day-to-day -day basis is really different from one person to another. There's a few misconceptions about naltrexone that are, uh, it's gonna work much better if you address them. So first of all, to keep on taking the medication if the person goes back to drinking, because if they stop, then obviously it's not gonna be useful. Also to remind the patient that naltrexone is not gonna make them feel so much different. Often people think it's gonna be like benzos, that they're gonna feel relaxed, that it's gonna change their anxiety level. It won't. Most of the time they won't feel any different. So sometimes people stop using it because they tell you, well, it doesn't do anything. And then when you question them, you say, but how much were you drinking when you were on it versus how much are you drinking when you're not on it? Sometimes there is a, a, there is a difference. It's just that they don't feel different. Um, so that's, and, but it lowers the craving. So that's the, that's the goal also with naltrexone. And often the patients will be able to tell you that it did lower cravings. I would say, I would say it's pretty much half and half. Half of the patients will see some benefits to it and half, but I have a bias because at the shim, we see patients that are uh, often uh, very complicated uh, alcohol use and uh, chronic. So it's not your typical patient who has some issues with drinking, you know. So, uh, but I would say that it's more or less half and half that that find it useful, and the other half that will say it doesn't do anything. And then, then if we assess that it really does nothing, that it's not just because they were expecting something different, like they were expecting a benzo-like feeling. So it's, it's deceiving when they, when they find that they don't feel this, uh, this relief, um, then we stop it if, if, if really it makes no difference. And we have other options that we try then. But I think as, as eMERGE doctors and as first-line physician, it's really worth giving it a try. I mean, you don't have much to lose, except if they're on opioid and you precipitate withdrawal. But other than that, you have nothing to lose and you might be really helping them. That's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. I know there's a few things going on in the chat, but I haven't checked the questions. Should I go on or does anyone else has a question on this? I think you can go on. The only other question in the chat is, is more about your consult consultation service and how you. Okay. So I, I will tell you about that. Yeah. So the other option, I see that the time is flying, so I, I won't discuss them too much. The other options are probably less relevant for uh, eMERGE doctors. So they're Acamprozat, which needs an exception drug, so you have to fill in something. And Gabapentin, just a reminder that it can be used for withdrawal and maintenance, unlike benzos that are only for withdrawal. But Gabapentin has more side effects and more consideration to, to, to keep in mind probably not the greatest because you do, uh, it would be recommended to uh, uh, follow up on these patients and adjust the dosage. And especially you want to make sure that they don't go back to drinking. Unlike naltrexone, gabapentin and alcohol together are not a good idea. Um, that's also taken from Ines. I thought it was a good idea to give you a, a the protocol, so just as a reminder, but still the first line therapy is again, naltrexone. So it's quite easy. And those are the other prescriptions. If ever you want to prescribe either uh, acamprozat or gabapentin. That's less relevant now. It's the rec recommendation uh, that uh, we used to use from uh, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, which were reminding us that we should really uh, offer either an altrexone or a Camprad to any patient who has alcohol use disorder. Um, and it's often, it's, it's just not done uh, by, uh, by family doctors. Um, but uh, now uh, Ines has a protocol that reminds us of the same. So that's, that's it for alcohol. And I would touch a word on opioids also, uh, uh, if you're okay with that, if no one has the other question about alcohol management. Well, may maybe this would be the time then to ask um, at the SHUM, where do you admit patients with alcohol withdrawal? If they're not in delirium tremens and requiring ICU, but uh, yeah. Was, do they go to general medicine ward or a short stay unit or what? Who do they yeah, go to? so um, uh, 
uh, there's two options. We addiction medicine has uh, our services has 10 beds where we admit patients. Mostly, I would say that most of these beds are used for uh, alcohol withdrawal when it cannot be done uh, in an outpatient setting. So uh, it's either elective admissions or they can be uh, they can be admitted when necessary from the uh, from the emerge. Um, so there's a doctor who's on call 24 seven and uh, uh, present on the floor also. Um, uh, but I know you don't you guys don't have that. So the other option is if the patient, for example, if the withdrawal is relatively easy to manage, but the person ha also has, uh, I don't know, pneumonia that needs oxygen, for example, then they would be admitted to internal medicine and we would follow uh, if needed. So the, our consultation service would follow to manage the withdrawal if, uh, if needed by internal medicine. So those are the two options. Do you have a short stay unit at uh, the show? We have a few short stay beds that we can ask for. Um, it's kind of a competition from any service to ask for those beds to access them. I've had very few patients admitted there, uh, but it happens sometimes, yeah. Okay. I think you can move on to the opioids and then if you wanna tell us more about your service in general. Yeah. At the end. Perfect. Okay, so let's go with opioids again. I'll try to be as practical as possible to what you can do, uh, what's relevant for you in the uh, eMERGE, but let me know if you have any questions. I'll skip on the background because it was discussed before, but basically the idea is just a reminder that uh, opioid use disorder and that overdoses are a, a major problem and we really have to do something about this. There's been an increase in the past couple of years and COVID was also really damaging. So the situation in, in Quebec is a bit different. Um, there was a lot of fentanyl in, the, in BC uh, uh, and slowly making its way east to Quebec. During the pandemic, what we saw is that the, the quality of the drugs available was really uh, poor. And the drugs that are found on the market now, well now, uh, when people think they're using heroin, it's never heroin anymore. Now there's a lot of fentanyl here in Montreal. A lot of new synthetic drugs also. We see a lot of isotanitazen, which is a strong opioid as well. And a lot of uh, opioids mixed with benzos. So, so that's really a dangerous mix. Often we ask patients if they are um, if they wish, we we uh, we do a urine drug screen to have an idea of what they're using, and it's uh, it's crazy what we find. Sometimes they they think they're using stimulants, and in the end, there's either benzos or even opioids in there, even in their stimulants. So that's also something to keep in mind. Is even if the person is not intentionally uh, using opioids, uh, a lot, there's a lot of contamination. And a lot of contamination with benzos also, and the the number of overdoses and that's keep on uh, increasing. COVID was particularly difficult. Also, the all the social distancing measures, among others. There's many factors why it was uh, it was increasingly dangerous for opioid users. But all the social distancing measures were making it more uh, prone for overdoses because you were using alone and no one was there for uh, to help you if needed. So, uh, so yeah, so it's really, uh, it's really something that we see on a daily basis. It has really changed. We work a lot of the, we work with the, um, a lot of the injection uh, sites like Texas and they, they're the stories they have. It's, it's incredible. Like the number of overdoses they see every day has, it's more than 10 times what they used to see uh, previously. So it's really, uh, it's really a crisis. So this, these, this is probably something that you're quite familiar with. It's uh, just a, the acute complication of, uh, of uh, IV opioid uses mostly. So just a few things to keep in mind. Um, sometimes patients present and they won't typically, the fact that they're using opioid and they might be in withdrawal, some, often their presentation is not so clear. So it's just a reminder that it's really important. There's a few CMP cases where the doctor was found quote unquote guilty because the patient was not assessed properly. It's really hard to differentiate when 
when the person is in, in, a, in an acute opioid withdrawal, they have so many symptoms. So it, it, sometimes it's hard to, uh, to assess if there's also an infectious component to their presentation. So just to keep in mind a few of the complications with, uh, with IV use and intoxication, like I said, there's a lot of uh, mixed uh, drug use. So it's really important to review the medication uh, of the patients. They might be on prescribed meds and to also really ask them what they typically use in a day and how, how they take it. Most of the time they, they, they will tell you if they don't feel uh, like you're judging, if they don't sense that you're judging them, they will tell you what they use and how they use it. And then you can have a much better understanding. If you're, sometimes we get calls by, um, by doctors for opioid withdrawal, but then when we reassess, we realize that the patient is also withdrawing from uh, Xanax or alcohol. So then it really changes the, the picture. So just to keep in mind. Um, then, okay, so I think that's an important topic because we get a lot of questions about that. How to manage pain on a patient who's, uh, who's an opioid user. So the, the quick answer is to give opioid as much as needed to treat the pain and or withdrawal symptoms because it can present as both, right? The, the patient can present with an acute presentation and uh, a, uh, a fracture or anything and might need opioid for that. And they might also need opioid to manage their, their withdrawal. And those are both reasonable um, reasons to give, them, uh, to give them opioids. Keep in mind that an opioid user, a chronic opioid user will probably need higher doses uh, than your, your standard patient. So it's important to reassess frequently and to adjust the dosage based on, on what they need. Um, there's a lot of stigma also to give opioid to a chronic opioid users, but uh, sometimes sometimes it's needed. And the only way to treat uh, opioid withdrawal is to give an opioid agonist. So 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 yeah. And for for pain also, it doesn't doesn't mean that they don't need the other uh, standard therapy. So it's absolutely fine to give them uh, uh, any other treatment that you think is. Uh, is necessary, including Tylenol and everything you would give to any other patient, but just to keep in mind that they might need higher doses of, uh, of opioid because they're more tolerant to it. If that patient, that, that's a tricky point, if the patient is already on Suboxone, so then people are, they don't know what to do with the Suboxone, should they stop it and then give only uh, short acting opioids? So the short answer to that is generally speaking, we recommend to keep the Suboxone. And if needed, to add on uh, short-acting opioids. Suboxone, we'll talk about it after, has really high affinity to the receptors, to the opioid receptors. So if the person needs more opioid to manage an acute pain, for example, you, you, you're probably going to choose an opioid that has also high affinity. Uh, uh, my choice is always uh, dilated because it has also high affinity, much more than uh, morphine. Um, and you might need higher doses because of that, because a lot of the receptors are already uh, binded with the suboxone and uh, that has a quite high affinity. So the short answer is to keep the suboxone and to add on if, uh, if needed. Then the chronic pain, the idea is the same. If you have chronic pain syndrome and uh, you think you have the, the patient develop an opioid use disorder, then your, your first line treatment should be if the patient accepts it, it should be an opioid agonist treatment. So either suboxone, methadone, or the third line would be Cadian. Um, if it's not, if the person is not already in treatment, um, and obviously all the, the non-opioid treatment also apply, just to keep in mind that gabapentin uh, kind of potentiates the opioid. So just to go easy with gabapentin if you prescribe it. And also a reminder that both uh, suboxone and methadone can be the dose can be split in BID or TID uh, for better pain control if, uh, if necessary. So that can be useful. It's not gonna make that big of a difference, but for some people with cr chronic pain, it can be useful. How to acutely manage uh, an opioid withdrawal. I see a lot of patients be, still being given benzos. It's a really bad idea. It's very dangerous. The only exception to that, if if you're also treating either alcohol or benzos withdrawal, then you're going to need uh, 
to give benzos to that person. If you're managing both opioid and uh, alcohol withdrawal, then yes, benzos are appropriate. Just be careful because both giving both benzos and opioid, we, we do it all the time because we have a lot of patients using, using many substances, but just to keep in mind that it's more dangerous. But if you're managing an opioid withdrawal, there is no place for benzos. Um, and it's really important not to force people from detoxing, like it was discussed uh, already today, but it's been, uh, it, it's been linked to uh, increase uh, death. So it's really, it's really dangerous. Uh, the only treatment is to give opioid and to start an opioid agonist treatment if possible, if the patient accepts it and if it's possible in your setting. If you're treating an opioid withdrawal, so if the patient, if patient presents to the eMERGE and is in opioid withdrawal and was already in, on an opioid agonist therapy, just a few reminders of things to keep in mind. Um, it would be a good idea to restart the, 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 restart the, the therapy that was, uh, that was already prescribed. Just to keep in mind that if the patient had missed, has missed too many doses, uh, he needs to be reinduced, so you need to restart the whole thing uh, from scratch, from lower doses, and then slowly increase. Depending, then the the induction is different depending on if you're on methadone or suboxone. I'll talk about suboxone because I think it's the most relevant for eMERGE doctors. If the patient has missed only a day or two, then generally speaking, it's reasonable to to just re-prescribe their regular dosage, except if there's something else going on and then they're highly intoxicated on another substance, for example, then maybe lower the dose. Uh, we standardly call the, we call the pharmacy to make sure they were given their doses regularly. Uh, the DSQ is not really, um, uh, sometimes it, it can be misleading for that. Uh, because if they're already on OAT, it's going to be on an O therapy, it's going to be on a daily basis at the pharmacy. So your best management is just to call the pharmacist and confirm. Um, also to keep in mind, if the person is on Suboxone and you want to re-prescribe their Suboxone, but they've been using fentanyl nonstop, by re-giving them Suboxone, you might induce withdrawal. And we'll talk about that in a second. So just to keep in mind, to ask them, when was the last time they took their Suboxone and what they've been taking uh, in the meantime. That's, that's for Suboxone specifically. This is a big uh, part where you can be really useful and have a huge impact. So just a reminder that you can prescribe Narcan kits uh, from the ER. We even recommend that you can give them uh, directly to the patients when they and when they present to the ER, if the patient is to be discharged, uh, we have kits in the, in the emergency room that we give patients all the time, but it can, these kits are also accessible in the pharmacy, so it can be prescribed and they can even access them without a prescription. Um, and Narcan can be given now uh, with a nasal spray, so it's much more accessible than uh, the, uh, the, than the shots, so much more easy to, to to prescribe. And I usually prescribe to give the patients two Narcan kit, for example, and with uh, uh, instructions. So the pharmacists really go through the how to use them and everything if they're not familiar. I would argue that it's reasonable to prescribe and give them to someone using any drugs, even if it's not opioid, even if they're not using opioid, just because of the risk of contaminations. Um, and those patients were not used to opioid will, are much more likely to overdose. Uh, so they're at even higher risk. If they use stimulants, for example, and it's contaminated with fentanyl, they will overdose because they're not used to it. Um, and a word on the harm reductions approaches. So just keep in mind that you can refer them to, the, to uh, any um, injection sites like Cactus, and there's a few in Montreal. I have a list uh, at the end of the presentation so that they should never be using a loan um, to, to educate them on the fact that the drugs are uh, likely to be contaminated these days, the dangerous combinations between uh, the, the depressants mostly, so alcohol, GHB also that we didn't talk about, but GHB is, a, is an important one, um, benzos and opioids. And when you do prescribe opioid to uh, think about prescribing daily with nest, uh, in, uh, uh, ingestion at the at the pharmacy. Uh, 
is there a question that I should be answering uh, now? I see that they keep uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what's going on. If the mm, there are questions about oh you're looking at the chat are you? Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep up. Okay. Uh, if a patient at risk for alcohol withdrawal comes in with a fracture and, and their pain is controlled, what is the risk that the CWA scale? Absolutely. So that's that's a good one. So uh, using the so well, wait, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm understanding your question right. The, with the CWA scale would underestimate the need for benzos. So if you have the if you have a patient who's chronically using uh, opioids and uh, alcohol or benzos, uh, then the scales either the CWA or we'll talk about the cows eventually um, cannot really be used uh, because you have two substances. Uh, to withdrawal happening at the same time. But the, I don't think that's your question. You're, you're mentioning that the pain is controlled with opioid, for example, if the patient has, or maybe, can you? It, can you it, yeah, this, so this is, this is a case that I see all the time. A, a chronic alcoholic comes in with a, a painful process, say fracture, and um, you give them opioids to control their pain for the fracture, and then the nurse comes and tells you, well, I'm not giving this medic the benzos, or you notice there's not getting any benzos uh, for low CWA scale. Um, what, what is the balance of risk if they're not that well supervised versus supervised in, in those cases? I, I mean, if- Yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. So it, it really depends on your patient and their history. But if you have a patient that has really a chronic- uh, uh, chronic history of uh, alcohol use and is in withdrawal, they, they really do need benzos for their withdrawal, even if they're on opioid. But you're right that the risk is increased. What I would do is I would probably most of the time prescribe a low, low, low dose of benzos regularly um, every four to six hours. And, and then add on some uh, PRNs if needed. But if, you, if you're, for example, if you're giving them a small dose of opioid to help manage their fracture, uh, they still do need benzos for their withdrawal. Otherwise you're gonna end up with a complicated alcohol withdrawal and, uh, or the patient is just gonna leave because they're gonna be uncomfortable and then they'll just drink more to, to uh, forget about their, both their pain and their withdrawal. So you have no, choice than to give benzos in a case like that. But that might be a case where uh, you would want to keep that person a bit longer to make sure they're safe. And also depends, depending on the goal of the patient, if that patient wants to stop drinking, well, that would be, uh, that would be a good time for, for uh, maybe a medical detox where you can give opioid and benzos and watch them. But if the person wants to go back to drinking, um, then I would give, I would be cautious with the, if you have to write a script, for example, for a, a opioid um, prescription at home for someone who's going to use alcohol. Well, first of all, you have to remind them of the, of the, of the risk of uh, overdosing. I would for sure prescribe them uh, Narcan. I would try to avoid opioid when it's possible. Sometimes it might not be. I would consider keeping them in the hospital for that reason. Um, it's all depending on the cases, obviously, but you can't keep someone forever in the hospital. But I, I would also use a um, high frequency of going, sending them to the pharmacy to help manage and probably lower uh, the opioid dose, dose to lower your risk. I, it, but it, in the hospital. In the hospital stay, though, it, would you advise the nurse not to use the CWA or like how can you get around the fact they're going to have low CWA scores and you still want to give them benzo sometimes? Well, if they're on a low dose of opioid for acute pain management and someone who's, uh, who's, who's not used to opioid, uh, maybe I, I would still, I would probably, first of all, depending on the opioid dose that you're prescribing, but the CWA will probably still work uh, because the symptoms of withdrawal will still be present. 
But if you, to be safer, I would probably prescribe a low dose, for example, every six hours, like four times a day. And then I would prescribe uh, PRNs, uh, of, I'm talking benzos. I would prescribe PRNs every hour or every two hours. Uh, according to withdraw, uh, um, alcohol withdrawal signs, and I would even list them if needed, um, the, the signs and symptoms. But I, you can also trust the, the patient to a certain extent, that, meaning that if the, person, if the person seems to be in alcohol withdrawal, tells you that they're in, in alcohol withdrawal, they're fully awake, um, they, they, they need benzos. So it's, it's really, for sure, you have to make sure they don't get into, a, they don't overdose, but they still need benzos. Um, so yeah, I would prescribe regular doses and NPRN, uh, depending on, the, on, the, on alcohol withdrawal signs and symptoms, yeah. And I guess the first couple of doses would need, uh, uh, would need, to be more cautious and then then you kind of know what the person needs and you, you go from there. Thanks. There's a question if you can just clarify what exactly the danger is in giving a benzodiazepine to a patient who is in opiate withdrawal. Oh yeah. Uh, so um, the, the, the benzos and the opioid kind of potentiate each other. So uh, the person is more likely to, to overdose. And you're not treating the withdrawal. So if and if you give a long acting benzos, for example, there's a good uh, emergency medicine cases episode on that. Uh, if the person, if you give Valium, for example, and first of all, you're not treating the opioid withdrawal because it doesn't, it, it's not the same receptors. So you're you're not treating the the right problem. But for example, if you're you're giving Valium, which has a long half life. And the person is going to be uncomfortable because you're not treating their, their withdrawal. So most likely they're going to they're going to leave, and then they'll use opioid again, and then you put them at much higher risk of overdosing. And there's another um, question about whether there's any role for ketamine. We don't use it so far. I I the the short answer uh, at this point would be no. Special, uh, except for pain management, yes. For acute pain management, yes. I'm not sure if that was for, for withdrawal or for pain management. For acute pain management, sure, um, but not for opioid withdrawal. I think it was for withdrawal. And there's, sorry, one more question that I missed from earlier was regarding uh, naltrexone um, prescriptions for uh, maintenance of uh, sobriety. Yeah. Um, and what you do if a patient is homeless or has no GP, do you still prescribe it uh, or do you? We do. Yeah, we do. We, we offer them to come back for their uh, follow-up lab work. And if they don't, honestly, I'm not too worried about it. It's much safer for them to be on naltrexone than to go back to drinking. So I'm okay with that, with the fact that they might not come back. To be fair, though, they might not buy the naltrexone because they still have, if they're covered with RAMQ, they still have to pay a minimum amount, right? So they yes. might decide if they're homeless, it, it might not be where they want to spend their money, but I would still write them a script, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I would I offer them to, to I, I, I would, maybe if you want to be, uh, uh, if you really follow the guideline, you can prescribe them the lab work and tell them to go to a, um, a Saint Rendezvous uh, clinic, but uh, they, they probably won't go and that's okay. Okay. Um, so these are, and please uh, interrupt me if there's, I'm sure there are other questions that I didn't see in the chat, so you can interrupt me at any point. Uh, these are the Narcan kit, the, uh, the nasal spray and uh, the little instructions that they, that they give to, uh, to patients as well, just to keep in mind that the Narcan doesn't work for so long. So depending on what they've been overdosing on, uh, often one dose is not enough. So that's why we always prescribe at least two. And it's a good idea to tell them that they do need to seek uh, care afterwards because after the Narcan wears off, they might still need 
they, they might overdose again. Oops. How, how quickly would it wear off? Like, are we talking an hour or? Yeah, I have the numbers. Give me one second. Uh, it's around an hour. Let okay. me just double check. But yeah, and a lot of the opioids that people use, especially the mixed substance that they use. So yeah, it's an hour to an hour and a half and it starts being effective within five minutes. Um, so it acts on quickly, but you can give a, a second dose if needed. The instruction actually uh, already um, discussed that, the need for a second dose. Uh, but it's sometimes they, they do need more afterwards. And that's also why if you had, for example, if you've had a patient in the emerge who needed Narcan and then they wake up and they're not so happy about it and they're in withdrawal, um, it's dangerous to it's dangerous to a certain extent to let them go because, uh, well, first of all, they're likely to use again and then be uh, overdose again. And it's also likely that by the time that the, the Narcan wears off, they can, they, they're they prone to a second overdose, especially if they've been uh, using in the meantime, it's gonna add up. Uh, any other questions on that? Okay, so just a word on opioid agonist therapies, and I'll talk more specifically about Suboxone, but I, because I think it's it's where you can uh, uh, really make a difference in the in the emerge. Uh, a reminder that opioid agonist therapy uh, was really um, studied and been proven over time with solid evidence that it reduced both morbidity and mortality. Um, by reducing overdoses, but all causes also, when compared to all, all other treatments. So all the, the assisted, uh, uh, assisted withdrawal or non-pharmacological treatment. It also reduced uh, illicit drug use and reduced the likelihood of uh, infection, especially HIV and hepatitis C, and it increases uh, treatment retention. And despite that, we, we often don't prescribe them, but it's, they're, they're good treatments and they're useful. So the options, the number one option is Suboxone. And then you're now the second line is Methadone. Suboxone is favorite because it's much safer uh, than Methadone. And then your third line would be Cadian, which is probably uh, less relevant for uh, eMERGE doctors. I, I suspect you wouldn't start Cadian in the eMERGE. Um, maybe just re-prescribing if it's already used, but that's also an option. Uh, there's been studies where it was shown that to start uh, uh, Suboxone in the, uh, in the eMERGE is uh, useful and helpful and help uh, better retention of patients. And we do see that a lot of the a lot of these patients don't have access to healthcare. They don't have a family of doctors. They they feel stigmatized. So the only time any doctor is gonna see them and is when they end up in the eMERGE. And sometimes it's voluntarily, sometimes they're seeking treatment and sometimes it's because they've just overdosed and it's uh, often it can be a, a good time also to, to speak with them and to see it, if they'd be interested in having, uh, in having treatment. So often you're the only person who can, uh, who can, who can do something with them because otherwise they won't have access to, to treatment. Uh, so, okay, so just a few words on Suboxone. It's a partial opioid agonist and, uh, and has a ceiling effect, which makes it much safer and it, it's less euphorian than other opioids. Um, people find it easier to maintain um, a quote unquote normal life. Um, it's, it also has a very high uh, receptor affinity, opioid receptor affinity higher than uh, any other opioid pretty much, and a lower intrinsic opioid activity. So the, the com combination of those two aspects is the reason why it can precipitate withdrawal if the patient is started on, on Suboxone and, and is not already in withdrawal. So if there's other opioid present, the Suboxone is going to kind of take over and <laughs> push the other opioid out. And that's that's where you're going to have symptoms of, uh, of withdrawal. Uh, it has a rapid onset. The long half-life is what makes it also interesting because it, it helps people feeling very stable once they've reached 
uh, they are maintaining those. The half-life is different depending on the dose. So at lower doses, the half-life is not as long. But once they've reached uh, their, uh, their stable doses, it can be given, it could even be given every, every second day. We usually give it every day, but it, it could be given every 48 hours. Uh, so that's, sorry, the, the slide is in French, but that's the ceiling effect. So it's the idea that other opioid, including morphine, heroin, fentanyl, any other, doesn't have a ceiling effect, but uh, Suboxone does. So it makes it much, much less likely to have a, a respiratory depression and to overdose. The, um, uh, just to keep in mind, though, that combina uh, the combination of uh, Suboxone and other depressants, so alcohol, benzos, GHB, uh, uh, could make you more prone to uh, overdosing. So that, that slide would not be true uh, if you combine other depressants. So it's it's much safer, but it's not it's not a hundred percent bulletproof against uh, overdosing. We get a lot of question about, so Suboxone is made of bup buprenorphine and naloxone. We get a lot of questions about the naloxone. Many people think that the, the naloxone part is what makes uh, buprenorphine safe. Not really when it's taken like it's supposed to be taken. I saw recently a prescription of a doctor saying that uh, Suboxone could be taken either sublingually or PO to the choice of the patient. Please don't do that. In order for it to work, it has to be taken sublingually. Um, otherwise the buprenorphine will not be, uh, uh, will not work if it's taken PO. The only reason, will not be absorbed, sorry. The only reason why the naloxone part is included with buprenorphine is to prevent diversion of the medication. So naloxone is not, uh, is not absorbed when it's taken sublingually, but it is absorbed if it's uh, taken IV or intranasal. And so it's to prevent people from crushing their medication and uh, injecting it. And that's the only reason why the naloxone part is there. Maybe you already knew that, but I, I see that a lot by people saying that uh, buprenorphine is safe because naloxone prevents the overdose. Only true if you try to divert the, the medication. Uh, maximum dosage according to guidelines is 24 milligrams a day, but we do prescribe, uh, generally speaking, I think uh, everyone in addiction medicine agrees to, to go up to 32 milligrams a day. And that's true in other provinces as well. So we go slightly uh, above. Uh, the side effects, so generally speaking, the side effects are the same than any other, uh, any other opioid, but it, it is safer on many aspects. It's also, it has less effect on the QTC compared to methadone, for example, which can uh, uh, makes it, uh, so with methadone patients, we, we do EKG regularly to make sure we don't in increase their QTC and don't uh, put them at risk, relative risk of uh, arrhythmia. Suboxone has much less effect on the QTC, so you, do not, you don't need to do a repeated EKG. Less effect on uh, hormones as well, so opioids are known to, um, uh, to be prone to induce in, uh, adrenal insufficiency and uh, uh, se uh, sexual uh, hormones uh, insufficiency also, suboxone much less. So that's also uh, helpful for patients who suffer from, uh, from uh, side effects from opioids. The, there are very few contraindication um, for uh, prescribing suboxone. Pregnancy is a relative contraindication. It's recommended to prescribe only buprenorphine, but that's that's a tricky one to get. Um, and have a severe hepatic uh, uh, insufficiency would be uh, um, contraindication. Although many patients who have cirrhosis, for example, and that are on methadone, we switch them to suboxone because it's uh, it's much safer than methadone for for uh, liver issues. But if you have a, civic, a severe uh, liver dysfunction, I would recommend asking a, um, asking a specialist before you, you start Suboxone. There are many ways to start Suboxone. I'll focus on the standard. I don't know how much time I have, not much. So I'll focus on the, on the standard induction protocol, which is probably the, the, the more useful one for, for emergency doctors. Microdosing is really interesting 
probably less so for uh, uh, emerged dogs. And macro dosing is a new way to starting Suboxone. It's been, there's a protocol that's been, uh, that's been written by two emerged doctors from Timmins in Ontario, where they have a lot of overdoses, opioid overdoses. It's a really interesting way of do, uh, uh, starting Suboxone, but basically it's the same than a standard induction, just with higher doses and faster, but it's this, the idea is the same. Microdosing is a bit different, but it takes more time and it takes follow-up. So maybe less interesting for you. Just a reminder that if you want to use a standard induction of Suboxone, the patient has to be in withdrawal before you start. So that's really good when you have patients presenting in, in withdrawal and asking for help. That's the perfect timing to start Suboxone and you can, you can help them being comfortable really quickly. Within a day, they'll be quite close to their maintenance, maintenance uh, dose. So the first dose that we recommend is between two to four milligrams. You have to coach them to completely let dissolve the medication under the tongue. Otherwise, if they swallow it, it's not going to work. You reassess more or less an hour after the first dose. You check for precipitated withdrawal. We'll talk about that. Um, and that's going to happen quickly if it has to happen. So within an hour, you'll know. And then you can... Uh, after an hour, if they're still in withdrawal, but not, not precipitated, it's just, it wasn't, the first dose was not enough. Um, then you can give additional, start giving additional doses. We recommend assessing patients every one to two hours and you can, you can give them additional doses as needed. And you can use, there's a scale, a bit like the CWA for alcohol withdrawal, uh, but it's called a cow's scale that you can use to kind of guide you um, with withdrawal symptoms. And the maximum dosage for the first day, uh, the maximum recommendation is to not go over 16 milligrams. And then you can keep on uh, increasing if needed. That's from that's a new protocol from Lines. Pretty much says uh, what I just told you. So that's just a reminder on how to start Suboxone. If you were to start it in the Emerge and you're not so sure, the protocol is uh, available and it's really close uh, to what we do in practice. Some, sometimes we go a bit faster than what they recommend, but it's close enough. So that's the cows. It's the equivalent of the Siwa. Uh, but for opioid, like the CWA, the problem is you, if you have uh, mixed withdrawal from many substances, then again, you're going you're gonna to stumble against the same problem. So the cows is really uh, um, should only be used if you have a pure opioid withdrawal and it's a mixed score and it's going to tell you if the, if the withdrawal is deemed to be uh, um, mild, moderate or severe. Okay, now if you do start Suboxone in the Emerge, you start your, your induction protocol and then the patient is doing okay and needs to go home. We do have a standard script that we use at the shim, but I'll be honest with you, we're reviewing it because no one understands it. <laughs> the ER doc don't, uh, don't understand it and we don't understand it either. It's, it's just, it's simple, but it's hard to put it in writing. So we're trying to figure out something um, which would be easier to use. But the idea is that, so you start your Suboxone, let's say you start at four milligrams and then you add on doses every, every hour or every two hours up until the patient is reasonably uh, comfortable. And then the patient can go home, but then he needs a script for follow-up prescriptions. So the idea is that, if, you, if you're letting someone go after only eight milligrams and he's reasonably comfortable, you can prescribe the, uh, the eight milligrams for the following couple of days up until they have, um, they have a follow-up plan. And you should be giving them access to a few PRNs because it might not, if you have them in the image with you for only a couple of hours, um, they might end up needing a bit more. So it would be reasonable to give them a few uh, additional doses for the first day uh, the induction day if they're not at the maximum doses already. And then the next couple of days, ideally, you should build on that. So if the first day, if they needed 10 milligrams, then the next day you start with 10 milligrams and you add on a few PRNs if needed, and then you build on that. And within about three days, you have the maintenance dose more or less. Um, or within 
yeah, within three days, usually they're quite comfortable. And within a week, you really know what's going on. Um, diff more difficult to do if you don't get to reassess them. I think what would be reasonable to do, though, is to give them uh, access to a few PRNs for the first day on top of what they got in the eMERGE. And the same for the next for the next couple of days, but you do have to refer them for a rapid follow up, um, and that's where it gets it gets tricky because at, at the shim, when the uh, when the doctors start a patient on suboxone, we have in 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 the addiction medicine services we have um, scheduled places for the next day so they they can be seen by a nurse and a doctor the the very next day and then followed up until they can be transferred to a family doctor if they have one or to another service. So we have those um, specific uh, uh, scheduled time that are reserved for uh, eMERGE doctors if they need to refer us patients. I suspect this is gonna be a bit trickier uh, for you guys for, for follow-up. So the very least you could prescribe them for a few couple of days. I've, uh, I have a slide at the end of a few services that do prescribe um, opioid agonist therapy, so you can try to refer them there, but that's where it gets tricky. It's for it's for follow up. Always prescribe the the first dose, so the regular dose, not the PRNs, but the first dose should be a witness dose uh, during the induction process. So at the pharmacy, so we fax the prescription at the pharmacy, and we make sure that the morning dose, for example, is witnessed. And then then when they when they take their medication, they have access to a few additional doses to be taken if needed for the rest of the day. And you prescribe them at the same time, uh, Narcan kits also. It's also a good, always a good idea. The famous, uh, precip and I'll end on that, famous precipitated withdrawal. Many people are scared to prescribe Suboxone. Many patients are scared to take Suboxone because of this idea of precipitated withdrawal. So it's really important to, if it, there, there's a few answers to that. Uh, one of the answers is, Microdosing prevents precipitated withdrawal, but it's uh, probably less relevant for emergency doctors because it, you do need follow-up, uh, regular follow-up in the first couple of days. So if you're gonna do a standard uh, induction, then the, the, the idea is that the person has to be in withdrawal before you start the medication to avoid uh, uh, precipitating uh, withdrawal. And it's gonna happen quickly if it does happen, I have to say it rarely happens. Like we managed to prescribe it in a way that we nev almost never see precipitated withdrawal. We get phone calls sometimes for that. And the treatment is to give additional doses of Suboxone to kind of fight it every hour uh, until withdrawal symptoms are under control. You can add on um, uh, clonidine, uh, naproxen to help manage the symptoms. Um, but mostly what's gonna help with the precipitated withdrawal is just to add on more Suboxone on board. And yeah, so, so th that's just a reminder of the other ways of starting, uh, of starting Suboxone, but I, I think I will stop there and maybe answer your questions. I've included, so a nurse uh, on my team prepared this. So this is a list of opioid agonist uh, treatment clinics. So, so a few clinics in Montreal that do prescribe those. Um, it's not because it's written there that they accept any patient though, but I think the most uh, useful resources would be uh, Le Cran et Relais Metadone who are accepting patients, but there are, there's, um, there's a delay though. And there's the Ertzel, which is affiliated with McGill. The other clinic, to my knowledge, don't accept to see uh, patients that are not already patients of the clinic, but I guess it would be, uh, le CRDM does do it, and CRD, Virage, Rive Sud, all these uh, sound de réadaptation dépendance are a good place to refer patients also. Um, and this is some resources that we give to the patients. So, it's just a list of, uh, of services that where they can seek help, including the supervisor injection sites here. So there's a few here, um, all that's uh, for Montreal only though. Um, and finally, a few resources, sorry, that one is in French, uh, for doctors. So there's addition, the addiction medicine uh, services offers uh, uh, services for doctors. So the, the doctor who's on call, 
for our uh, hospitalized patients also takes calls from the rest of the province. <laughs> just be, just keep in mind that we get calls from the, the whole province. So it's really for, for uh, emergency if it's, uh, if it's in the middle of the night, but we're happy to help. So you just call the, the shim and you ask for the, for the doctor on call uh, with the addiction medicine uh, services and you'll be uh, immediately transferred to someone. And a few of the resources that I quoted in the, in the presentation. So Lines has just published a few, actually many guidelines and uh, prescriptions also uh, examples both for alcohol and opioid. CRISM is also a good resource. And the last one, Dépendance et Tinérance, it's a good website that has a lot of resources and, uh, and protocols. So that's also interesting for uh, uh, opioid and alcohol. Okay, sorry, I talked for too long. So um, I'm happy to uh, answer your question. Uh, Jean-Marc, are you still there? Did you wanna um, ask your questions about the, how the service is organized? I'm not sure if he's still there, but his question was, can you elaborate on the organization of your service? And in addition to withdrawal treatment, what other consult service do you offer? Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, we try to be as accessible as possible. So patients can uh, refer themselves or they can be referred by another physician. Mostly, uh, we get referrals for, for either for alcohol withdrawal when the patient has um, difficult com comorbidities, for example, and needs to be hospitalized. Uh, so we get referral for, for that and we can admit. So what happens is when a patient is referred to the outpatient clinic, um, they get rapidly within a few days to a few weeks, they get an appointment with both a nurse and a doctor for a further assessment of their case. The, the appointment can be um, uh, in telemedicine or in person at the SHIM. And then we try to help them and uh, refer them to the right services. So either we put them on our waiting list for admission if they need, uh, if they need, it's mostly for alcohol withdrawal, I'll say for, uh, uh, for elective admission. Sometimes it's when there's a mixed substances also, and it's too tricky to do on an outpatient basis. So sometimes we, we accept patients for other, other reasons also. Um, otherwise we can refer them to other services if we find that we're not the right, the right setup for them. And we also get referral for uh, opioid, opioid agonist therapy uh, when, when there's no other services where to, uh, uh, to, to prescribe opioid agonist therapy for the patients. Our goal is to stabilize the patient and to then refer them to their, to their family doctors. We get referral also sometimes from switching uh, for switching uh, opioid agonist therapy. For example, someone who's on methadone and needs to be uh, switched to Suboxone. So that's something we can help with. Um, sometimes it's just questions if the, the physician is less familiar and they just need uh, coaching and help. So that's something that we can do also. Um, so yeah, so there's three branches of our services, there's the outpatient clinic, uh, the consultation service, where the doctor is on call for the our own eMERGE and uh, the whole hospital, but also takes phone calls from the rest of the province. And there's the, uh, we have 10 beds for hospitalized patients. Thank you. And there's a question from Joanna uh, asking about the medical legal responsibility to report a patient with substance use disorder who you suspect is still driving. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, it's, uh, I, I, okay, so usually what we do, it's, it's tricky because you have an obligation um, to make sure that the person doesn't put everyone at risk, but at the same time you have, uh, you don't want to destroy the patient uh, physician relation. Generally speaking, what we do is that we advise them uh, not to drive and we try to assess if they're likely uh, to, to drive again. If I've had many patients telling me that they used to do it and we like strongly advise them not to do it. And we also advise them that we would have to report them if we knew that it was still happening. 
And most of the time it ends there. But you, after you've done that, if you know that the, uh, they keep on driving and you, if, and while being intoxicated, then you do have to, to report them. And the good part is that they would already be advised that you would do so because you would start by telling them not to do it and, and advising them that you, you would have to report if you were to know that it's, it's a situation that keeps on happening. But it's really rare that we do uh, report patients. Thank you. And it's uh, Josh is interested in hearing more about uh, your team and how many doctors and nurses. <laughs> so yeah, I know my colleagues were really scared that we would end up with <laughs> hundreds consults. So we're a small team. Uh, we're seven doctors at the moment. Normally we're eight doctors. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, what, what do you, what more do you want to know? So yeah, it's a small team and we share. So we each do uh, the, the hospitalized patients every, you know, every seven weeks or so and same for consults and the rest of the time we do outpatients clinic. And uh, a lot of us also have to do a little bit of a regular follow-up patients on the side because of the, the new uh, government measures. All right. So um, I either myself or Elise will will contact you to um, see if you could email us all the various resources that you have shown us because I think there's a, a lot of interest in everyone having time to uh, look those over and uh, refer to them later. Um, are there any last questions? I think and I think in the chat, someone mentioned the cost, the, the precise cost of naltrexone. Yes. And thank you for that. And with the people who are with RAMQ, there is a maximum per month, right? And after that, everything is covered. I think it's around $90, if I'm not mistaken. And afterwards, it's covered. And thank you so much for your patience. I've let my, uh, I, I, I will give you my email address and I'll be Happy if you have more in that questions that maybe I I uh, didn't answer. I'll be happy to answer them if you if you email me. This this was a really great talk. I think we would love to have you back if you want to talk about other addiction uh, medicine uh, issues for that are relevant for emergency doctors. So thank you uh, very very much for coming here today. Thank you. It will be my pleasure. And sorry, you had to injure my, uh, I'm so used to working in French now. So oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry about my accent. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. I guess we will uh, leave it there then. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. <laughs>